All right, so hi everybody. We are here today with our beloved Dan Wingate, who has been known in the Lucy community for decades as an archivist and a historian and just a general, incredible, fantastic, wonderful guy. And he has been working tirelessly for the past, I don't know, Dan, however many years, five years on producing, directing, writing, composing, editing, all of it. Uh, an incredible, heartfelt, tribute documentary to the incredible talents of Kay Ballard, who we all love dearly and we love Dan dearly. So we wanted to really just, just spread the love of Dan's incredible work and kind of bring it to the forefront of everybody. If you don't know who Kay Ballard is, I'm sure everyone has questions and um, everyone's gonna learn so much more about this documentary uh, and about her once they've viewed it for sure. Before we get really started though, it does air tomorrow night, right Dan? Yeah, and a matinee. On Wednesday, yes, and it's free mm -hmm. to like check out. So, totally free, which is we're also really excited about because everybody can see it that wants to see it. Incredible around the whole world, there are like yeah. you know, there's yep. no time zone that's exempt from this. It's that was her wish, so she got it. You Aww. know, and that's what's so Amazing. great. You know, so great, so great. So, we just wanted to pretty much start off by asking you can you tell us just a little brief overview about the lady herself, about Kay Ballard? And, and why do you think people would want to know about her? Well, you know, I, I got a really uh, easy gift today because I just saw a review, not that I'm going to be reading most of them because it's too nerve wracking, but um, one was forwarded me, to me today um, where they actually completely got the reason that I did it in, in their review and they talked about it. And um, what they said was basically was I had always dismissed Kay Ballard as sort of this sitcom actress that was loud and she would show up on these TV shows like Love Boat and she was always this pushy woman that was funny but her her demeanor was outside of my sort of what I care about and a little too loud and for me. Yeah. But what I discovered in the documentary, this is them talking, what I discovered in the documentary was she had this completely other career that I had no idea about all these dimensions wow. and for me that was that made me feel so good because that really was what made me decide to do it because um initially the backstory of how this happened of course obviously I met Kay when we did the mothers-in-law DVD set many years ago that's when we met for the first time and we Amazing. really hit it off Kay you know, became my sort of Italian mother that I had always wanted. You know, my mom's been gone a long time. And I can remember when I was a kid complaining to her, it's like, this family is so dull. You know, it's like <laughs> nothing ever happens. Nobody ever yells. Nobody ever gets excited. Why, you know, I'm like, why can't we be Italian? You know, like this. And I used to do this in the house. <laughs> and I got my wish. You know, it's that careful. Oh, wish I got my Italian mother. But it mm -hmm. was, you know, uh, over the years, we just became really close and good friends. And, and I just enjoyed seeing her so much because I had a friend who moved out there. And so whenever I would go out there, I would visit her. And uh, I, would, I had left Sony to uh, study screenwriting. I had a film that I wanted to make. And uh, so that was happening. And I didn't know anything about this documentary. I didn't know it was in progress or anything. And then all of a sudden, one day, uh, I was down there and she said, you know what? I've changed my mind. I want you to do it. And the first couple of times I actually turned it down because I knew enough about her career when we did the mother's-in-law that it frightened me. There, yeah. it was, there were so many dimensions to it. And I thought, you, this is a hard story to tell uh, just straight unless you can really start to think about it. So I turned it down two times. And then the third time I figured out that I wasn't being asked. <laughs> Uh, and then I realized I better get to work. So, um, so Your Italian, Italian once, family yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Once I decided, I uh, started researching. I did a, a, a long period of research in preparation um, and doing more analysis of her career. And it was just like, okay, well, maybe from an archivist standpoint, this is an opportunity to to start a conversation not only about Kay but about all of these people that are judged by TV work that have all this other work they've done that never gets considered in yeah. their canon, never gets contributed because television is so dominating and it overshadows everything else, you know, when it comes to like theatrical things where there's much less 
footage and ephemera of. Um, you know, so this was an opportunity to do that and sort of, I, I was so thrilled in that review that that person got that, that that was like, this is, this is an opportunity for us to look at Kay this way and then also say, who else have I overlooked or dismissed because of my judgment of their, you know, work on television that I've seen? Yeah. You know? Because mother's in law is the only thing of hers that's really still seen, except Muppets occasionally, you know, an occasional appearance. But that is really the only thing that's regularly rerun that gives an impression of who she was. You know, all of the variety show appearances, all of that stuff, that doesn't get run enough. Totally. For, and a lot of them haven't even been remastered uh, for them to see those. But you will see things in this doc that you have never seen before, ever. And I know this, but um, uh, things that have were shown once, you know, in the fifties and never been seen again. Amazing. Um, and and they're pretty remarkable, pretty incredible. So you came to know Kay as a friend and through this documentary, a collaborator. But I wanted to know, as someone who loves TV and film as much as you do, what was your first introduction to her as a performer? Mm. Um, it probably was the mothers-in-law, although. Um, like my friend John Connors in Chicago says, Mothers in Law was one of those shows because there were only 56 episodes of it. It didn't run in syndication regularly in the United right. States, at least. But you'd see it whenever a ball game got rained out. They'd run a uh, Mothers in Law. You know? So it was like that. So occasionally I would see, you know, but he said, that's what John said. In Chicago, the Mothers in Law is the show that got shown when, it got, when a game got rained out. Oh my gosh. So anyway, but um, I had seen her on that and I'd seen her on the Dar Station. Um, that was my complete impression, you know, occasionally on Love Boat. And I would say, you know, she, I love her. I mean, it's just, she's one of those people that you just, she has that warmth about her. Absolutely. She's that I'm drawn to immediately. And, and a realism also. And that's what was so ahead of her. She was so ahead of her time all, in so many stages of show business and uh you know that's sometimes can be hard you know because you got nobody to confer with <laughs> while you're standing out there in front of everybody else you know? totally absolutely yeah. but that was my initial that was initially how i knew her. so but kay buell leaves such a huge impression on the screen with the mothers-in-law how did it differ from when you were actually face to face with her and kind of just about to enter her orbit yeah well, I remember the day that I met her because uh, we came down to record commentary for uh, the DVDs, which yeah. they didn't get used, but we did them anyway. Hey. Um, but um, that was because of the, we, we needed to have more discussions about what you put in commentary and what you don't. Uh, so, but that wasn't very clear at the time. Uh, but anyway, um, but we just, you know, it was one of those things, Kay was, was two years younger than my mother. My mother was from the same era as her. I was a late baby, you know, my mom was 40 yeah, years old when right. I was born. So <clears throat> I was more familiar with that generation, most people my age. And the minute that I met Kay, I recognized the energy of my mother. And mm. it, it's, it's not only the energy, I think, of people that age, but also of facilitators. And that's what my mother was, and that's what Kay was. She was one of these people that was always facilitating, oh, you, you need to know this person. You, you go over here. You do this. You do that. And she, awesome. it's like the, the universe has these people yeah, that do connected. this, that makes history happen. And in this documentary, there's several examples of it where Kay is at the forefront of something very, very special. And, and facilitates that happening without any credit or involvement in it. Uh, but it. it's because she was there that it happened. You know? Absolutely. So that, that, was, that was what attracted me when I met the real person, uh, Brock, to your question, was she had that warmth that my mother did. And I imagine that that's why mm -hmm. she's so beloved in this business, you know, because that's not common. Sure. <laughs> There, you have so many great clips of Kay that you were just talking about, and you can see them in the trailer. Is there anything uh, that's a particular favorite of yours or something that you think is very special oh. that people will be seeing? Well, 
<laughs> how to pick one, right? <laughs> there are a lot to choose from. kind of hard. <laughs> um, I would say probably the one that's going to be the most surprising mm -hmm. to people is uh, one of the earliest ones um, where she talks about, she's talked about many times about her doing her Judy Garland routine and how that's one of the yeah, ways yeah. that she first started making money doing her Judy Garland impression. And she does it on a show uh, and you're going to get to see it. And like I said, it's, it's from uh, 1953. Wow. Uh, and uh, she's just, you can tell she's a starving kid in the village. She's skinny as a rail and like, oh my gosh. you know, you can tell she's performing every night in the clubs. And, you know, it's just like, once again, this thing that I talk about a lot about the accidental miracle of television in that these people, it captured what they were doing in clubs uh, as it was developing as a media. It was a capture device of these performers and the way they performed before we changed the technique to showing the audience singing along which we did wow, yeah. but at that time we showed the performers performing so anyway uh, but awesome. yeah that one's probably that's probably the one that'll be the most although the one that Mr. Sheridan brought to my attention uh, is probably also <laughs> uh, probably also up there as well the Craft Music Hall um, Gypsy Clip yes so yeah, that's it's in there and it's pretty spectacular. So wow. Yeah. Oh, man, it's gonna be awesome. No, it's gonna be exciting to see the Judy Garland number. Yes. Yeah, it's astonishing. It it's really astonishing. And I don't use that word a lot, but <laughs> if when you see it, it's like this is this is what I was telling my friend the other night. It's like Kay, if you wanna do a byline of this, it's like Kay brings her receipts. Okay. <laughs> Kay has got her receipts. And she is going to claim her spot. And that's what's so beautiful about it is because when you see it, you understand why that propelled her the way it did. Because you just oh, sit yeah. there and go, holy smoke, what the, what is this? Uh, take it away. <laughs> yeah. So, For sure. yeah. So, you know, we are the Lucy Lounge and we'd love to delve in a little bit into mm -hmm. uh, Kay's relationship, both professionally and personally with both Lucy and Desi quite separately. Um, you want to shed a little bit of light on that about, you know, how she became involved with Desi and how she became involved with Lucy on and off screen? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you a little bit of it. It's in the documentary. So I don't want to give, you know, I mean, it's not anything new, but, <laughs> but the trail of it is basically, you know, Kay, um, she had hit that point in her career where, you know, and this is the other thing that I was trying to do was show this narrative of what happens to people, especially women in show business, when they hit a certain age and it's starting, the handwriting starting to get on the wall that their shelf life in this business is, is winding down. And that's kind of what, where Kay was starting to be with Broadway. She had been on, you know, uh, in Golden Apple and Carnival and she had gotten all these incredible reviews, but no recognition from, from, the Tony people at all. And um, she, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about it at one time and she'd also auditioned for MAME, you know, and it was a great disappointment to her that she wasn't being considered anymore. Yeah. And I think also the other thing that happens is that you have like, when you look at Kay coming out of Spike Jones in the 40, late 40s and going into New York, into Greenwich Village, there was nobody like her, nobody. She wow. was her own thing. But within 10 years, there was Carol Burnett. Then yeah. there was Barbara Streisand, Edie Gourmet, all of these people. Now, the thing is, is that she didn't hold any personal. It wasn't personal, but you can't help but feel like your turf is now being usurped by these younger people and you yeah. can't get young back. I mean, that's the thing is once you've lost that, yeah. It's really hard to make a case for, you know, and, and none of those people didn't deserve what happened, but it was her timing. Again, when you're ahead of the curve, you miss the curve sometimes. And it's just the way it is. And it was a part of that that kind of comes with the territory when you're the kind of performer she was. For sure. Know? Yeah, but but did I answer the question? 
Uh, not so much, but what it was, was more or less, <laughs> it was more or less, tell us a little bit about how K became associated with oh. both Lucy and Desi separately. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. So she was kind of trying to figure out what was going on in the mid sixties and she was doing her club dates and uh, Lucy had seen her at the uh, Blue Range uh, with Gary and uh, came back afterwards and they spoke and then Kay deduces that this was then followed up by conversation with Desi, Lucy, telling Desi, hey, I just saw this girl and she'd probably be great for this show that you guys are looking, because they had been looking for somebody for Eve Arden to do a sitcom with for Desi. Yeah. He had a deal to do a sitcom uh, or several things at NBC. And um, so uh, it was just one of those beautiful things where she was in this club, she was sick, she, there were riots going on in the streets, she was in Detroit, and she was not feeling very well at all. And who was in the audience that night but Bob Carroll, sent there oh. by Desi uh, to, you know, to scope her out. And he walked up afterwards, and another, I'm going to let her say the words in the dock, but, uh, you know, the, it turned out to be fortuitous and perfect, you know, Beautiful. and it was. I mean, it really was a, a, a huge get all the way around for, you know, for everybody. You for know. sure. And she was so great in the mothers-in-law and you know Desi did take an amazing you know shot by putting her in it she's yeah. flawless and fantastic and yeah and as she available. says also now some of the mothers-in-law uh, that have seen the the mothers-in-law dvd a little bit of what's in 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 that behind the scenes thing up in this obviously i had a lot of other stuff to focus on but it is different there's more stuff um, but we do show, I do show uh, quite a bit of behind the scenes stuff, show Desi in action, directing, uh, show the audience and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and her talking about the difference between um, working in front of an audience and then working without an audience on Dar's Day. Um, so, but she loved Desi and it was a perfect, you know, it was kind of the perfect thing because Kay had been by the nature of, you know, joining Spike Jones so young, she got to meet, you know, she went to Fred Astaire's 50th birthday party when she was oh, a kid. That's amazing. She met every famous person in the world before she was even 20 years old. So by the time that she met Desi, it was, she was intimidated by him, but <laughs> it was easier for her to handle yeah, being around sure. Desi Arnaz because of that, you know. Um, so yeah, but she, I didn't use the dog story, Lucy's dog story, only because <laughs> it just took too long to tell. Um, but we'll save that for the we'll save that. Yes, we'll bonus. Find that we'll save that for the bonus features. Yes, totally. <laughs> Here's some cute photos of, of them together in the mothers-in-law. Yeah, she really okay. loved him and, and he loved her and they, they just, you know, he was the kind of person that she liked to work with in the business. People that were real, down to earth, not any airs about them or trying to yeah. you know throw their power around stuff like that she knew the she knew the most incredible performers in the world from the time she was young and she knew that it didn't have to do with anything other than pure talent the rest Maybe. of it you just treat people like you want to be treated you know and Beautiful. that's what she believed in. absolutely yeah. uh, i'm going to share a photo here too of one of the definite fan favorites of here's lucy was her guest appearance Yes. Well, she played Harry's love interest, Belladonna. Yes. yes. Um, which we have is a clip in the film. Adorable. Absolutely adorable. <laughs> yeah, she talked I, about it. Well, go ahead. I was saying, my, my kids even love this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she, uh, she, didn't, she wasn't too crazy about having to be in that fat suit after oh, having Oh, gosh. To, you know, no one would want she that. Really, yeah. She really, and they promised her one without the fat suit, but that never happened. <laughs> But anyway, um, that was hard for it. You can look at, you can see in this picture, actually, you can tell, you know, her dangling on those high heels. Yeah. That big old body wouldn't be able to <laughs> She wasn't. Some practice. She hadn't been enhanced. <laughs> for sure. Mm. Let's see here. But she did, you know, she did love Lucy and Desi both tremendously and respected them so much because of their, 
credentials and how they were still very real people despite of it. That's great. So I think Jimmy has a question. Why? Uh, well, you <laughs> have, uh, lacks of, uh, well, De De I mean, Kay moved into Desi's house eventually. Yes. yes. It was Desi's, Desi's wife's house that he was sharing with her, but I think it may have been his for a period before that. I'm not sure of that, but I do know that, uh, yeah, he sold her his house. Uh, and, and, and that she credited as being the greatest thing anybody ever did for her because it That's gave true. her a, a foundation, a place to stay, you know, oh. and to be and build a new life. And it had, I actually got, you know, I got to sleep in Desi's bed when I was there one time, which was a huge, for me, you know, just a huge thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it definitely is a, is a special little place, that place. It's, it's a beautiful full circle moment, just, you know, yeah. that she stayed there, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a really special uh, thing. And I'm all, I'll always be grateful for it, you know, always. Yeah. That's great. And there are a lot of special people that are interviewed, that you interviewed for the documentary. Uh, like Carol Burnett and Woody Allen and Margaret and people who are no longer with us, like Carol Channing and Jerry Stiller. Amazing. Uh, can you talk a little about interviewing some of these people and did they say anything that surprised you maybe or anything fun that they might have said? Yeah, well, you know, a couple of them were real. I mean, like, of course, obviously, I never realized or thought that we would get half these people that we got. You know, we Incredible. were working a very tight budget, but we wanted to make sure that we had production values that would allow us to take it as far as it could go. You know, we didn't want anything to hold it back in that regard. So um, we made sure that we had budget and could barter when we could, but a couple of things happened that were just very serendipitous. And it's just those things that you can't plan on. The first one was um, Hal Prince. So the way how Prince happened was um, I was at the Paley Center uh, with Jane Klain hanging out, as I am want to do in uh, New York City when I'm there, as Jimmy knows. Um, and um, I was, you know, rifling through stuff or whatever, and, and she had gotten me the NBC cards on K. And I actually forwarded one of those. Don't tell Jimmy. I forwarded <laughs> one of those to Laura uh, just as an example. Uh, to show how they, because they would basically have index cards that listed every performance of a performer. The networks would keep these cards like a box of recipes, you know, and they would just keep adding to it index cards as that performer's life. And Kay's got, I don't even know how many cards that woman's got. Wow. She was on the Tonight Show so many times that it just keep, they keep going on the card and keep going on the card and then they'll turn the card over and go on the card. You know, it was just like on and on and on. But the very first entry, on television was April 3rd, 1949, which is my birthday. Oh my goodness. I saw that. I saw it said the Hugh Martin show. And so I started doing some more research and I found out that the Hugh Martin, you know, from, from the MGM, you know, musicals and all that stuff. And, yeah. Gar, um, and uh, so I did some more research and, and saw that it was directed by Hal Prince, which I'd never known. Wow. Wow. Or, you know, uh, and why would I? But so, but that made me go, ha, huh, well, I wonder if he's got a kinescope of it. You know, and this is, you know, 49 is a weird term because kinescopes hadn't become commonplace yet for certain types of shows. Uh, if it was an afternoon show, if it was a da 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 da, those typically weren't kinescope. The evening shows were the ones that for rebroadcast on the other coast. Right, or, yeah. Never. Um, so, but I didn't know it was too much on the line. So I, I asked Janie, I said, you, have you got contact info for him? And she said, yeah. So I wrote him a letter and asked him if he might have a kinescope or know somebody that might. And he replied and said, I don't know of an existing kinescope, but if you want to interview me for case doc, I'd love to do it. So that's how that's that one happened. Amazing. Which was a complete yes. shock. Um, also because he settled something that had been um, extremely uh, hurtful to Kay over the years. And he talks about it in the documentary and he makes amends and it's amazing. And it changed her. I can say this um, 
because after we did the interview and I sent her, I would always send her all the interviews after we did them, you know, for her to look at them. Of course. And, um, after that one, I could tell that she got to release a hurt before wow. she left this place. She wow. got to release something that was an unresolved hurt. You know how those can be, you know, totally. as the years go on and you question what you could have done, to, you know, and it's like it then, and this, he comes along and washes all that away. It was, it was miraculous in that way. And then the other one, it sort of happened weird like that was Woody Allen. And it was also through Jane Klain. It's her fault too. Um, I was, I had done the Glass Menagerie uh, restoration because of Janie. She had set that up and we had done that. And Woody Allen contacted the Paley Center uh, after the airing because he'd heard about it, but he didn't see it. He wanted to know if he could get a copy of it. So Janie forwarded that request to me um, and I was going to make him a screener and I thought, be pretty stupid if you're making a documentary <laughs> with, you know, if you didn't ask him. See, so yeah. I got up my nerve and I asked him and he said, yes. Amazing. So I was like, yes. okay. We're interviewing Woody Allen. okay. So that's, that's really, incredible. yeah. I mean, and both of those were, like I said, completely unexpected. But and it also, it and it's it also just shows how beautiful Kay is that all these people are like, yes, please. I want to give back to her. You know, it speaks volumes. I'm certain her. that I'm going to be bombarded with angry people that weren't given the opportunity to speak. <laughs> about. Well, I mean, knowing how many people she knows, you know, the, the odds of that are inevitable. <laughs> <Pretty great. laughs> so you came into this, uh, this, this documentary, Kay had a vision for the story that she wanted to tell. Your, your vision for it evolved along with uh, the production process. I want to know if you could tell me about, I guess her reaction, Kay's reaction to seeing this documentary unfold and seeing her, how her own story developed and was being told through your eyes and through the, the eyes of the people that were being interviewed yeah. about her. Well, you know, it, uh, it was a it was a long road, but um, you know one of the things that was challenging um, was that um, you know documentaries take a long time, uh, especially somebody the the for every career you have add a you know for every decade of a career add another this much time researching their career you know yeah, somebody that's of, been in it that long this can take a long time decades. to go through. For sure. so, yeah, so through that process, Kay really hasn't been exposed to that kind of process before. So her idea of making a documentary did not involve as much time as it actually takes to make one. Yes. And uh, and I would always point out to her, you know, jokingly when I was down there busy, I was like, okay, let's look at the Ken Burns. Look at all those people. And, you know, all I, I got room for a sit for symbols between my kneecaps. If you want one more shot, I can play one more instrument, okay? But oh my gosh, this yeah. is as fast as I could go. You know, and so that was the only thing that was kind of a little bit, but once she saw the form that it was taking, she totally got it. She loved it. I sort of decided actually, uh, because I, I, I really struggled with how to approach it until I came across, I just, I realized that the best way to do it to my mind was in the style of the old showbiz biography, uh, where you cover their career and you do it in a way, not, not in a like, totally glossed over way but with some with some value and 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 you know with some uh nostalgia yes um, and so more, it, you know the 70s were kind of the birth of that nostalgia craze of like all the stuff from before all of a sudden there was nostalgia for everything in the culture television culture and everything else culture you know and that's when a lot of that stuff started showing up. You know, the old ABC wide world of entertainments, they do salute to the Fox musical, salute to this, <laughs> da, 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 all that stuff. Yeah. And so I sort of felt like that's what it was because Kay, you know, the type of documentary style that's done today would not be appropriate for what no. to her mind, because she wants the audience to enjoy themselves. That's her Spike Jones. That is her. She counts the laughs, every single one of them. <laughs> she knows when the first one comes, how far it is into the, you know, it's like that whole thing. And so 
um, I was glad I finally decided to do it in that style. And once Beautiful. I did it in that way, she was she was very happy with it, and uh, and she was she was pleased, even though it was challenging at the end because you know Kay has been deaf in one ear her whole adult life, and people don't realize this, but it's one of the reasons I think that her singing. Uh, and her hearing are so acute because the the because she only had one the work wow the work yeah with, but this sort of worked to our disadvantage a couple of times in screenings because she couldn't hear the audience reacting mm. and she thought they weren't you know mm. so it was always a challenge you know so I started recording the reactions so that I could take them back and prove to her it's like no Ma you're wrong listen you know, hey, no. I love you hear that laugh right there <laughs> <laughs> so. But but ultimately, she was so thrilled. And I'll share with you, the, the thing that I will take with me always is that when we um, found out that we got in the best of fest after we had the premiere, which she went to, then they have a thing with the Palm Springs Festival where they do a best in fest and they, uh -huh. they have a week of screenings of that. And when we landed in that, I got a phone call from her. I was at my friend Mary Jane's and Indian Wells. And... Um, uh, picked up the phone and she was like, I hadn't heard her in, you know, a while, even though she never was really diminished, but she was like, did you hear the news kid? We showed those bastards. She was so happy, you know, because she had, gotten, she had some people in her orbit that were trying to get rid of me and we're trying to, you know, change the direction of things, which this always happens. It's not, that's not yeah. unique to anybody. It's just the nature of the biz as they say, but, uh, but we got, we got to the end and she was thrilled with it. And, and then we were, you know, on our way. So I'm just, the thing that I'm thrilled about now is that that version that was in Palm Springs was what I call the Hail Mary version or the Hail Mary. What, yes. Version. Oh my gosh. Because, because I didn't have any time. She was dying. We knew yeah. she was dying and I had to get something done and finished in time to show. And uh, so I basically, yeah, that was a that was a, a wild month leading up to that to that uh, festival. But you know, she saw it and she was thrilled with it, and you know, literally had got to float on that love for the rest of her days. Literally yeah. went out on that wave that's of so happy. Lovely. You know, so that's the you know that's the thing that I heard those words in my head. Sometimes I. I asked myself, you know, hey, you should let it go to voicemail just so you'd have it. But oh, you, you, can, yeah, well. you can't know those things at the time, right? Of and uh, I would have picked up and I heard her voice in my life, So that's just how that was. But she was genuine. She genuinely did love it. She did. And she was happy. That's amazing. So, Dan, what do you think would be the take home message people might like or that you want people to know about the documentary after finding out about the tour de force of K Ballad? Well, the, I, I guess the main thing is, is that, you know, like we talked about before, that with, with Kay and with so many of the performers of her generation and her time that came up in that same way, there are so many opportunities to find out more of what they did. And a lot of times nowadays in our culture, we just judge by a surface skin, you know, and that's everything but you cannot get to the depth of these performers with a surface skim because they were more than that. Absolutely, and yeah. their careers were more than that. And like even the clips that are in it, you know, it was really a lottery because it was so much stuff. It's impossible to put this whole career in a movie. It would be for a sure. mini series that went on for like ever. There's no <laughs> way to do it. And it would cost a fortune. Dude, you know, I mean, yes. it's like, even with the little bit we have now, it's been, it's been uh, challenging, but we got there. Yes. Dan, how did um, Kay's passing affect the post-production process? And what, how did it end up on this uh, online platform? What, what led to it coming, this online premiere that we're excited yeah. for? Yeah, so, you know, after Kay passed away, um, you know, none of us were really sure what the next steps were going to be, and we didn't really want to think about it, you know, for a little while. Yeah. And so it sort of, we just sort of let it, you know, cause it had been like running a race up until that point, nonstop until she passed away. And then once that happened, it gave everything a chance to just sort of settle down and everybody to kind of regroup a little bit. And 
then it, you know, of course, I didn't own the film. I don't have, I don't own the film. I was for hire director. Wow. Um, and so uh, then it went into the trust and there was a lot of stuff that had to be worked out legally. Um, and so after that, um, we began to talk about film festivals seemed to be the next logical step. Uh, and uh, so we were preparing for that. We had, we had uh, started along those lines and we'd actually gotten a couple of film festivals um, that we were going to attend, one of them in New York. And <clears throat> as a coincidence, um, because we were going to do this festival in New York, I uh, reached out to a friend of mine who has been a publicist for many years. And I said, do you know anybody in New York that we might engage to help us with some publicity for this that I can refer, you know, to the, to the uh, people uh, working on the film and they did. And this person saw the film, loved it and thought, you know what, I'm going to take it to these guys because it's these two guys that formed this company, Rama yeah. Rama, who's distributing it. They specialize in musical documentaries. And so wow. um, that's how it happened. It was completely unexpected. I had been on a, different project. I've been editing another film um, just as an editor uh, since the end of last year. And um, so I, it was, I was working on that. And then all of a sudden I get a letter one day or an email one day from, from a lawyer saying, guess what? We've been picked up and we're, it's going to be da 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 da. And I was like, ah, now I got to finish it. Oh so my gosh. the last, <laughs> last month has been finishing it. Oh, man. Um, and uh, I went back to the mat with it again. You know, it was like, okay, again with this. But, um, but I was, you know, always obviously grateful, but it was a little bit of a time uh, crunch to get it done. But I'm glad that we got here. And I'm so grateful, you know, to everybody that's helped make it happen. Because the other thing I will say is that, you know, a lot of times in these discussions about um, films of this nature that have a lot of, music in them uh, can be very, very challenging to clear and to, to release because of the expense. Um, they yes. have to be, you have to pay for the, for the use of that stuff. And, uh, it, and you have to allow, allow them to profit from your movie as well. That's the whole concept of it, you, you know. And so uh, there are 55 pieces of music in this film. Wow. wow. The cost of clearing it, I won't even get into, but oh it is gosh. so mind blowing that your appreciation, you know, can just be a blanket sort of like, thank you <laughs> to the people who made this possible because it would, oh, it, it would not be happening if it weren't for people who loved Kay, um, who were, wanted this story told. And, and wanted her last wish to be fulfilled. And this was something that by the nature of the type of entertainment this is, that kind of angel was needed and they showed up. So I'm Aww. very grateful for that. Right. That's yeah. really beautiful, yeah. Yeah. So Fulfilling that, her last, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just, I was trying to re remember if I answered your question good enough. You did. You know me going off on the trail, so you anyway. You sure did. <laughs> I wanted to know, like, since this this um, pr this journey of fulfilling Kay's last wish has been such a labor of love uh, for you and for her for the past uh, five years. Now that it's you're ready to unleash it upon the world tomorrow, where do you want this film to be in, let's say, twelve months from now? Mm. Well, um, I want it to have a full and long life, and uh, I know a part of the path it's going to take because that's already that groundwork's being laid now and that's exciting um my dream was for it to be released theatrically because that's how i designed it i designed it to be seen with an audience yes with a group of people together so that you have that collective energy of an audience enjoying Absolutely. it and so eventually i hope that happens and the great thing is is that this company uh, we'll do that if it's possible for it to be done and, 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 you know, economically. So that's the other miracle of this is that we found the perfect people. I can't imagine having to explain myself and what Kay's legacy and all of this means to some of the other 
distribution outfits that just are only concerned with skewing young and hip and this and that and dismiss this type of stuff as a, just old, you know, mm-hmm. move, moving on, you know, kind of thing. So we got, we got lucky in that regard. So that's my wish is that it gets a theatrical run so that, because I think there is a huge demand if, we, if it's safe to do that at some point. Yeah. Um, but then after that, um, it, it will have, uh, the people that are in charge of it do have plans for it to live on forever uh, and protect it. So that's, that's encouraging to know. It'll always be around. Aww. Yeah. 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 It's pretty special. It's the, the way that they've, uh, I don't want to give it away because I don't want to, I don't want anybody to lose their, you know, I don't want it to be, that was mother's news, Bess. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you that. So I'll, I'll wait and let them do it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, I'm very happy that it's gonna, if, if everything goes okay, it's gonna have a long life and people yes. will be able to enjoy Kay as the, as the performer she was. You know? We can't wait to see it, you know, whenever possible in a collective audience scenario. Yeah. Until then, we can't wait for tomorrow. <laughs> we'll collectively yeah. gather online. Yes, yes. So as people collectively gather online, you have the finished product there. But I wanted to know since, since Kay's career covers every, almost pretty much every single media invented so, invented so far, what questions, what unanswered questions do you still have about Kay Ballard? What do you, what would you love to ask her if she was still here and ready to go for tomorrow's premiere? Mm. That's a good question. Um, we talked about a lot of stuff over the years. Um, and, you know, uh, just try, I'm just, pardon me while I review. Yeah, of course. Many facets of this woman's life. Um, you know, we were always hearing these stories and it, even, you know, down to the last minute, I mean, within days of the documentary premiering in Palm Springs, I'm sitting at Kay's house with, one of her friends that's known her for years and her friend starts telling this story uh, that Kay had never told me what? about them going to Barbara Streisand's opening at the International Hotel in Las Vegas <laughs> and seeing her and Barbara Streisand stopping in the middle of her show when she sees Kay sitting down front and walks over to the edge of the stage and points at her and says, that woman could sing a Fanny Bryce song as good as anybody. Aww. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me this story? You know, and of course, everybody else is like, go get Barbara Streisand on the phone. Right? We need an interview. And I'm like, please don't go do that. Okay. Oh so, my but, but, you know, it's that's, there was, with for everything that I knew about Kay, there were a million other things that I was constantly finding out about her, like literally every day. But I have to say that just, you know, as far as um, anything that, that I'm not quite, um, you know, there are things that we didn't, that we didn't talk about in the documentary that, that were personal, that had more to do with um, her allegiance to her grandmother and the type of things that she would talk about and the things that she wouldn't talk about. And she felt like she was representing the family name. And so there were things that were not comfortable for her to discuss. Um, didn't mean she didn't want to, Just she just wasn't comfortable. And so we didn't. But um, I, think, I think we pretty much covered, in terms of me personally, Brock, um, you know, most of the things that I was curious about, I can't really think of anything, honestly. Boy, I sure scoured that brain for it, but I, I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't think of anything that, that's remained since that I would ask her, because I still talk to her all the time. She's, oh. you know, she haunts the house. She's, she you know, is. She's here. Yeah. She's here. So anyway, um, but yeah, she, she was just a remarkable, I think, you know, with the Streisand story, and I think with a lot of the others, she had a, she had a humility 
that was hard to understand because of the bravado that she was able to present when she performed, that strength and that, that solidness of her talent uh, sort of, you know, belied kind of a shyness that she had and a, and a sort of a insecurity that she had about her looks uh, and about, uh, you know, other, other aspects of herself that people just, you know, wouldn't know, um, you know, about her normally. She, she did have a, a, she was kind of like, the stories like about Streisand giving her a compliment, she didn't know how to deal with that. She didn't know how to deal with those kinds of compliments. Even when you paid them to her directly, she'd come up yeah. with a joke, yeah. to, you know, a punchline for her. So it, yeah. So she wouldn't be like, you know, seeming conceited to be holding court and taking compliments. You know what I mean? She just, she, she was just always concerned with not being that coming yeah. off that way. You know, that's really sweet. Save. Oh, and that's the other thing that I'm so excited about is that, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, but um, one of the things that's in there now that was not at the premiere of the case saw is we got the footage from carnival. And it's pretty oh, spectacular. Wow. From the Ray Knight collection, Miles Kruger let us have oh. um, footage from Carnival uh, that's oh. never been seen. That'll be exciting. pretty spectacular. I mean, yes. it's not a lot, but there it is. And you know how it is. It's like, again, here's my receipts. There I am on stage in Carnival. You know, <laughs> Amazing. Bow down. Yes. <laughs> so, you know. But yeah, so that's the, you know, and that's the, that's the great thing is when you have, that's the value of this footage is that, you know, you can have talking heads until the end of time. But if you've got that footage to back up what they're saying at that moment, that's gold. You can't top that. That's just like that, that in that way you can be immersed. And that's what I was trying to do, you know, the other thing that in the beginning, there was a lot of people had opinions about the format and what I was doing. And a there were a lot of voices in there that wanted a narrator. And I was like, we got a narrator. Mm -hmm. We got K. Mm -hmm. Because to my mind, and this is not a criticism in particular of anybody or anything that uses it, but for me, to my mind with this, um, when you have a narrator, that is a point of view that is above the action. In other words, you are observing from outside the actual person and saying, K did this, and now K did it. So we're observing from a perch like this. But if K's telling it, yeah, right there beside her, we're experiencing it. it with her. We're not looking down at it, observing it. We're in it and we're wow. it's happening and so we get to feel the emotions that she's feeling when these things are happening to her mm. and that's the secret to me is like when you can when you can have the voices of the people telling the stories storytelling that's what that's all to me it all went back to that it's storytelling period absolutely and, and and you know when you have that corroboration with the clip by the person or a person that was there that's just like that's everything well dan you are one of the most beautiful storytellers that we know you tell amazing stories in your art in your you know in your mind in your words that paired together with k we can't wait to see it <laughs> with your I'm storytelling excited. and your storytelling and the narration for sure yeah i'm i'm excited i'm, I'm finally getting to the point where i can relax a little bit about it and, oh and, yes and, you know, it's, it's gonna happen day. and you know here we go you know Yay. So, yeah i'm ready Absolutely. for i'm ready for k i want her to you know I want, and i want her friends that cared so deeply about her to feel that too i want them to feel like she got the appreciation she deserved because so many of her friends knew that and knew of knew of the things that didn't happen you know for various reasons that weren't in her control. Yeah. Um, and so for that, I think for a lot of them, that will be something that this will give them a feeling of closure too, that she's going to get appreciated 
uh, properly, you know, mm -hmm. for her contributions, which were many, so many, so many. Oh, I mean, boy. It's, it's not even, there's no way to even, count. I mean, when you talk about, I mean, like I, the other thing I think of is uh, her talking about Fred Ebb and how, you know, he was this starving kid, wasn't even with John Kander yet. You know, and she was paying his rent. She gave him money for rent every week. Wow. Keep him wow. working because she knew he had it. She, he hadn't brought it yet, but she knew he had it. You know, <laughs> Sheldon Harnick, same thing. Incredible. You know, met him in uh, uh, nor at Northwestern when he was still at Northwestern. The very first piece of material he ever wrote was for her. Ever. Wow. This guy wrote Filler on the Roof. Yes. You know, it's like... This is what I'm talking about. It's like she was there at the beginnings of so many people's careers, so wow. many people's, and she never wanted credit for it. She never cared that she got credit for it. She just wanted to be active and in it because she loved this business more than anything. Yeah. Else. That was from the time she was a child. It was all she ever cared about. You know? Oh, man. Well, Dan, we can't wait no. for tomorrow. It's going to be gorgeous. Um, is there anything else you wanted to ask at all? We have a couple of minutes and then I think we'll play out with the little video clip. So Dan, do you want to introduce the little video clip for us? We're going to play yeah. you out with Mama Kay. Yes, yeah, so this, <laughs> this is Kay at one of our, I think it's called Kidsies or something like that. It's in, okay. it's in Palm Desert. Uh, and it was a place we went to, we went to breakfast a lot. And um, so what this one time, it was me and her and, and, and Mavanwi um, and uh, her friend, and we, we went for breakfast and she started talking about this song that she had written uh, when she was traveling. And she, had did, she started noticing all these fast food restaurants among all this great art, you know, all over this oh, yeah. wonderful architecture and stuff. And then there'd be like a KFC next to it or whatever. And so that's what caused her to write it. You know, and so I said, well, do it for me. And she's like, here? And I'm like, yeah, I'll pull out my phone. <laughs> and so I, I set my phone up and, and leaned it against the little thing that holds your little uh, uh, sweeteners and stuff, you know, yeah. on, the, on the table. And I set it up against that and I got it ready. And then I was like, <laughs> okay, go. And so that's how it starts. <laughs> Super cute. It's adorable. It's a little background noise. I'm sure we can all hear it and listen to it. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, Dan, thank you so much for all your thank time you. and joining us today. Thank we thank you. cannot Love wait you to see guys. tomorrow. We're going to be yep. giving you standing ovations from all corners of our globes and respective <laughs> continents and countries. <laughs> well, I, I just, I'm very grateful. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Huge congrats. Thank you, you got it, Dan. Thank you so much. So let's see if okay. we can play this adorable video. I'll see if I can screen share it here. And Kay can play us out. Here you go. You guys see all that? Yep, there she is. All right, brilliant. Let's click like the end. I'm a Chancelise on the Appian Way and an Avenue Way. There's McDonald's by the Trinity King Tuck. There's a Tuck for a Nuts and a new Pizza Hut and McDonald's. And the scholar they sing by a big Burger King where the styrofoam boxes go sweet. And in Turkey, we're sick at some things, finger licking the kernel goes up in a week. I just can't believe, even in Tel Aviv, in the land known for bagels and blocks. As I wail by the wall, in my new prayer shawl, I look up and there's snack in the box. In Siena, I lean, I think, there I think, what our fast food chain's trying to prove. What's the use? What's the hell? I just heard Taco Bell when I'm franchised the wing at the loo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, girl. <laughs> That's my girl. There she is. All right, Dan. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.